Hello, I'm John Burnside. I'm the opening act. Is that the right word? Um, and my subject for today is, um, is kind of Randall Jarrell's Bat Poet po book, a very lovely book um, for four children. I want to say a little bit about writing four children and about childhood as being two entirely different experiences, certainly in my book. Um, and uh, this was a book that was published in the mid-60s, early 60s, and beautifully illustrated of those who like art by Morris Sendak, the, the Where the Wild Things Are Man. I don't know if you can see this. I should have brought slides, but um, I, I actually prefer these pictures to Morris, uh, to, to Where the Wild Things Are. But um, really what I want to talk about is, is much more personal and about, what, about the memory of childhood and what we think we remember when we remember childhood, and what we think we're doing when we write poems that remember childhood, for example. I should also say that, before I start, that I've, I've done something experimental this time. I've printed on my, my talk on both sides of the paper in a, an attempt to be more environmental, but I'll probably get confused now which, which side of the paper I'm looking at, so do bear with me. Think of me as a large child. A very, a very large child. <laughs> uh, this is a quote to begin with from Randall Jarrell. Um, I'll say a bit more about him. He's one of my favorite poets. He's very much underrated, I think. But he, um, he didn't really write for children in the way that many people consider poetry for children is written. He wrote poems coming out of his child, I think, which is much different, I think. But um, he was also a vicious critic, a really wonderful critic, a Serbic. But he's very kind to everyone who wrote children's books. And he said, I found there's no children's book so bad that I mind you having liked it. About the tastes of dead children, there is no disputing. I've done it already. <laughs> this, is the, this is the tragic thing about insomnia. What happens is you then sit up all night rewriting your paper or correcting it or something and finding that you've actually got completely confused and that you should have put page numbers on it when you were doing that. Um, Hmm. There is one page mysteriously absent. Start as you mean to go on, I always say. Um, this is odd. Oh, I don't, see? It's on the back of my title page. And now I've mixed up the rest looking for it. <laughs> I don't remember having a childhood. I remember public events, formal and colorless, like the italicized dates in a farmer's almanac. Easter weekend, the summer holidays, the last day of school before Christmas, and of course, Christmas itself. I remember various birthdays, two weddings, a handful of bereavements. I am still haunted by a week-on-week -week sense of hymn tunes and folding chairs. And I specifically recall Valentina Tereshkova, or rather, I recall the thought of her a Yaroslav woman with hair the same color and style as my Aunt Margaret's, guiding her Vostok 6 48 times around the earth during the summer of 1963. And I remember wondering if she had gone to the hairdressers the day before the launch, as my mother or any of my aunts would certainly have done, to make sure she looked presentable for the cameras. 
That was important to people like us, to be presentable, not beautiful or elegant, but presentable, which is to say tidy, another key concept of my early years. There were many ways to make things presentable. You could tidy, or you could tidy up, or you could even tidy round. And my mother used to use that saying, tidy round this, because like, that was a black hole that you couldn't possibly tidy, so just tidy around it. Um, you didn't buy elaborate or fanciful items of furniture or attire because you couldn't keep such things tidy. Pets were bad for the same reason. Any accumulation of pretty much anything not only looked untidy, it may also attract vermin. And having spent the first several years of her married life in a rat-infested tenement, my mother was determined that nothing we did would attract vermin. I seem to think that in 1963, I spent a fair amount of time trying to picture Valentina Tereshkova's house. Was it tidy? I imagine it as spick and span, not one salt cellar or porcelain ornament out of place. The dishes wiped and put away. The books she had accumulated during her 10 years of night classes lined up on their shelves in alphabetical order. Soon. I don't know if anybody remembers Valentina Tereshkova. Um, she was the first woman in, in space. Yeah. I don't remember moving away from our first home, a pit town in the west of Fife, but I remember going back. We had gone to Birmingham for several months, though I couldn't say how long exactly. My father, a casual laborer, was looking for steady work. But when he couldn't find anything better than what he was used to, we returned whence we had come not to the tenements this time, but to a prefab in the same pit town. There was no steady work in Cowden Beath, we knew that, but it was home and we had family nearby. Still, I seem to recall feeling uneasy in our new lodgings. In fact, I think the whole family did, and it took a whole week of rain to bed us in, by which I mean the green edge of town rain that seeped into the prefab through the door and window frames, a wash of moss and what looked like fish spawn accruing on the larder walls. Every crack in the asbestos frame stopped with a clutch of green fleece, a nameless organic mass that smelled of sump and cistern, leaf rot, and the stilled bitters of viriditas. I seem to recall thinking that this triffid-like greenery was intelligent in some way. But I was smart enough not to talk about it or about the idea that came to me every Sunday as we were walking home from Mass, that we were strangers in a place that belonged not to us but to the animals and the fish in the rivers and the crusts of lichen or lichen spotting the branches of the winter trees. Later, when we moved again, I knew I, why I felt uneasy coming to the prefabs. It was because our return to Fife had shown me that home was not the fact that I thought it would be. This new move to the steel mills of Corby in the English East Midlands brought us for a time to a real house with hot water and windows that didn't let in the rain. But I knew it wasn't really ours. We didn't have a home because you have to make a home out of something more than tidiness and having enough to pay the rent. Still, though I'm painfully aware of it as an idea, I do not recall those years of homelessness, homelessness in any detail. I remember a holiday at Clacton, a fight I had in the square outside our house, two more weddings, another bereavement. But I do not remember these things as events or as film loops running at the back of my head. It's more like the recollection of writing things down in a diary. At some point, it seems, I stopped making, taking very much notice 
of the given world and pretty much confined myself to the world I was manufacturing as the best alternative to the given world, the best that I could manage anyway. The world I invented, not just from special moments, pretty much all of them solitary, I am obliged to say, but also from books, films, songs, pictures, and whatever else I could find in the chambers of my own imagery. Soon I was living in two worlds, though my presence in the outer world was becoming more and more nominal. And I was under no illusions. I was not on, I was only, sorry, pardon. I not only knew exactly what belonged to which world, I also had a very sure sense of which was real and which was a mere fabrication. For example, as Christmas approached, I knew that the outward business of the day belonged to my parents' world. The morning to my mother, for whom we all traipsed off to mass. The afternoon to my father, if he was present and in the mood for playing paterfamilias. The rest, however, was mine. Or rather, it belonged to the inner business of the day, to the secret, essentially pagan world of light and fire, and on those yuletides when we were graced with it, snow. Bing Crosby could croon away about a white Christmas all he liked, but the actual weather out in the world that surrounded our house belonged to a long ago pagan pre-Christian world that I could taste and smell and hear through all the distractions of the self-designated real world. Outside in that real world, like the grown-ups in Dylan Thomas's stories of childhood, my elders went back and forth in the snow, the men in lumpen coats and women in church-going clothes, walking home from church or kirk. I live in a town which was sectarian, so you were either Catholic or Protestant. Kirk was Protestant. Sometimes kindly, too often ugly in their bigotry or their puritanism, always black and gray, and more often than not, frighteningly serious. They seem to me distant and unknowable, like bodies sheathed in those full body plaster casts that used to be applied to some tuberculosis patients, familiar in their delineation, but oddly uncertain in the details. As a child growing up in that world, I was tested um, for tuberculosis and I had a horror of the idea that I would be positive of what the term was and end up in this, they used to, some people used to end up in these full body casts that completely immobilized you. And I was terrified of this idea. It didn't happen very often. Someone should have explained that. The seeming unknowability of others is of course a familiar cliche. A critical point in the child's growth might come when the, <coughs> when the inability to understand other people turns back on itself and then is expressed as the real old chestnut, nobody understands me, which is then formalized into a vague existential generality. It is much of a commonplace as it is, and is often subjected to satire and kindly mockery, the growing child's sense that we can never know the inner life of another creature remains oddly poignant. I once worked in a garden center for an African gray parrot hung in pride of place in a fine cage at the center of the main glass house. And I have never seen such a picture of loneliness and boredom. Whenever a new customer came into view, the bird would call out and for a few moments of fuss and mock conversation would follow until the human became self-conscious and moved on to other things. Usually the parrot would try to extend the encounter, but when it became clear that he was alone again, he would fall silent, looking for all the world like the child I could remember being alone on my first day of school, a child who didn't speak the language of other children, or so I thought and so was unable to make any real connection with them. For whatever reason, upbringing, natural predilection, I felt no, kin no kinship with these specific others. Though that didn't mean that I believed kinship was not possible. 
It was just that a search would be necessary to find my place in the world and others who were of my kind. The caged parrot never experiences this revelation, however. It speaks to everyone it encounters, and most of us reply, but all we do is echo back and forth endlessly. We do not converse. That African gray, who might never have seen another of its own species, was doomed not to know the real conversation was possible and could have happened if only it had come to be amongst others of its kind. For me, the resolution of the dilemma came partially at least from finding a book which was partly a short story and some poems for children, but mostly a kindly and inclusive parable about how poems are made. A book that turned up rather miraculously in my local library, far from home. The frontispiece said that it had been published by Aladdin Books, New York. How it got there, I do not know. But I am grateful to the vagaries of contingency that it did. That book was The Bat Poet by Randall Jarrell, with illustrations by Morris Sendak. However, before discussing this genuinely important work in its own right, and not just as a, as a, in the category of children's books, I have to take a small diversion into the work of the world's most underrated psychiatrist, if I, can, if I have time to do such a thing. Okay, so. Ian D. Sutty only produced one major work, a critique of Freudian analysis entitled The Origins of Love and Hate, published by Keegan Paul in 1935. It came out the day after he died, age 46. It is a powerful, even enchanting work, incisive and far-reaching in its scrutiny of the Freudian's insistence on what he called nastiness for its own sake. He was Scottish. We do, we do believe that anything sexual is essentially nasty. Um, it's like vegetables. Positing in its place, an investigation and dismantling of what Sati calls the taboo on tenderness. Lovely phrase, the taboo on tenderness. It seems wrong not to give this work the full attention it deserves, but for time's sake, some carefully selected exam excerpts might serve to set out those features of the argument that could be considered relevant here. To begin with, Sati's main difference with the Freudians, and I know this is a simplification, especially for the psychiatrists in the room, but um, it isn't for the sake of brevity. His, this difference with the Freudians arises over their insistence on the part played in human development by the sex drive, almost to the exclusion of other concerns. Against this, he posits the notion of shared interest, which leads not to neurotic and jealous possessiveness of the mother, but to an, an increased tenderness towards her. And, uh, growing sense of connection and attentiveness to their plastic cast, sorry. Um, growing sense of connection and tenderness to the shared world. This is the key idea. This idea that instead of um, the mother being the, the sole object, gradually the child begins to share the world with the mother and then with others. Manifest as a child grows in the desire to make and share a culture and to enter into egalitarian love friendships. And we come to the first quote with, on the handout, if you have the handout in front of you. We have now to consider whether this, this attachment to mother is merely the sum of the infantile bodily needs and satisfactions which refer to her, or whether the need for a mother is primarily presented to the child's mind as a need for company and as a discomfort in isolation. I can see no way of settling this question conclusively, but the fact is indisputable that a need for company, moral encouragement, attention, productiveness, leadership, etc., remains after all the sensory gratifications connected with the mother's body have become superfluous and have been surrendered. In my view, this is a direct development of the primal attachment to mother and further, I think that play, and that's the key word really, play, cooperation, competition, and culture interests generally are put 
as substitutes for the mutually caressing relationship of child and mother. By these substitutes, we put the whole social environment in the place once occupied by mother, maintaining with it a mental or cultural rapport in lieu of the body, bodily relationships, caresses, etc., formerly enjoyed with the mother. A joint interest in things has replaced a reciprocal interest in persons. Friendship has developed out of love. True, the personal love and sympathy is preserved in friendship, but this differs from love in so far as it comes almost by the direction of attention upon the same things rather than upon each other, or by the pursuit of the same activities, even if these are not intrinsically useful and gratifying, as is the case with much ritual dance, etc. <coughs> the interest is intensified even if it's not entirely created, artificial, by being shared, while the fact of sharing interest deepens the appreciation of the other person's presence, even while it deprives it of sensual or better of sensorial qualities. So to, to kind of paraphrase that, what, what matters here is not this seemingly kind of claustrophobic, uh, looking at each other type relationship, it's this sharing and looking outwards. And I think that this relates to, to culture in, in an important way. This then is Sati's view of the process of sublimation. And it differs from the Freudian's analysis in two important ways. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> First, it dispenses with the need to define all pleasure and satisfaction as sexual. And secondly, it brings to the fore the power of shared interest, leading to creative and appreciative play and so to culture. In this analysis, necessity or need is not the mother of invention, play is. And pathological attachment to the other or the dread of loneliness predicated on the unpredictability and willfulness of that other is transformed into a companionable state that allows for both the preservation of selves and respect for the other's integrity. Originally, Sati says, and this is the second um, quote on the handout, the baby mother bond is vaguely and intuitively appreciated by the former as mutual absorption. By degrees, the baby's expanding activities and sense impressions change the character of this bond. A service rendered to the baby's body and a caress <coughs> are originally indistinguishable by it but the baby's perceptions of and interest in its own body and its immediate surroundings grow rapidly under the influence of the mother's ministrations. In this way, it develops interest in itself, the process Freud misconceives as narcissism. I think that's probably the key thing in Sati's ideas. <coughs> Excuse me. This rejection of the idea of, 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 of the kind of pathology of narcissism, the interest in the self is not a bad thing, as it were. Um, and if you grew up in Scotland, where people really don't know how to love themselves, um, any, any redemption of narcissism is a good thing. It is of course, or anybody else, for that matter. It is, our, it is, of course, arbitrary to say at what point the companionship of love becomes the companionship of interest. But there is no doubt that the feeling relationship of the companions does change as attention ceases to be absorbed wholly and reciprocally, each in the other, and becomes directed convergently to the same things. Cooperative activities, identical or complementary attitudes to outside happenings, build up a world of common meanings, which marks a differentiation from simple love wherein the world of each is the other person. The simple direct bond has become a triangular relationship wherein external objects form the medium of play. For me, this was exciting when I first read this um, because I had, like many other people, done one of those one-on-one type courses on Freudian analysis and thought, oh my God, is this the world I'm, I'm entering? Is this really such a thing as penis envy? <laughs> um, or things like that, you know. And I really did object to the, 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 re, the reconfiguring of my favorite myth the narcissist myth as some kind of pathology. And Sati felt like a kind of, you know, uh, release from all of that. 
But I felt it's, it's really important to relate him to other thinking about this kind of sense of this center from which um, people develop, not just children, but grown-ups, and also whole cultures. Just as the child goes out from the secure home ground of proximity to the mother in order to explore further afield, so we as adults, individually or in true community, move out from the security of a home place to recognize space much as the child does, as openness, freedom, threat, and as complementary, since space and place require each other for definition. We see this in Seamus Heaney's various writings about his home place in Moss Bourne, voiced in prose as the child's repetition of the Greek word for center or homestone, a marker indicating the navel of the world, the omphalos. I would begin, this is a quote, I would begin with the Greek word, omphalos, meaning the center of the world, and repeat it, omphalos, 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 until its blunt and falling music becomes the music of somebody pumping water at the pump outside our back door. And he realized it fully in, in the poem Sunlight, dedicated to his mother, presumably the person pumping the water, in which that sense of a center obtains an extraordinary gravity. This is a quote from that poem. There was a sunlit absence. The helmeted pump in the yard heated its iron. Water honeyed in the slung bucket. And the sun stood like a griddle cooling against the wall of each long afternoon. From this gravitational center place, I want to argue, following Sutty, that the child ventures out into a kind of weightless condition, space, and once there is able to participate, in a range of adventures, which I'd roughly decide I would roughly define as acquisition or appropriation or colonization and exploration, appreciation and understanding. Sadly, the two are not mutually exclusive. Though it seems to me an obvious matter of pure observation that the one is ignoble if natural as the other is commendable. And it would be a fine education system that alongside the child's exploration and play helped him to her, her to see that. Such a system might be summed up in Dion Fortune's maxim, the adept owns nothing but has the use of everything. It is my belief that if poetry has any influence in the moral formation of the child, it is in suggesting, and I'm all too aware that poetry is not a pedagogical practice, any more than it is a form of legislation, Yabu sucks Shelley, that there is something ignoble in acquisition that the colonist with the flag is a lesser mortal than a true explorer, say, or that the self-validation of the big game hunter is less interesting than the curiosity of the naturalist going unarmed into the same territories. For the lucky child whose omphalos is, as it were, sufficient in its gravity, exploration can be a noble pleasure, and importantly, what they bring back, this is me trying to use non-gendered language, this never works. What they bring back, i.e. the child, singular, it helps to strengthen the home place. And this is also important, I think, coming out of study. It isn't just that the child grows, but the, the child's adventures coming out from, as it were, the omphalos, what they bring back to the omphalos, as they keep returning for, for security, that also enriches the home place. And again, this is what I think of culture and cultural exchange. That being so, threat and terror are part of the natural activity of being in the world, elements of the overall experience that as we confront them help to define us in finer detail and so help us grow. In order to go on moving out, in order to maintain the play of space and place of self as subject and other as subject, we have to be able to play. The more we play, the better players we become. And it is this play 
this moving back and forth between the known and the unknown, between home ground and the out there-ness of the still to be experienced that gives us culture. Culture is the play we engage in in order to hold the world as one. At times, however, this play will run the risk out in the as yet and navigated space that is not yet, it's not home, of falling into the sweet, foundering immensity where all that is familiar, thought, self, home, ground, is momentarily lost. Here, if there were time, I'd launch into um, a disquisition on the great poem by, um, I'm running out of time, uh, I, a disquisition on Leah Pardee's poem, um, and the, 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 um, the, the poem that he, he imagines the immensity of the infinite space around him and loses himself in it and um, is, is both, as it were, drowning in it, but also has a feeling of being blessed by having experienced it. It's an extraordinary poem, but there isn't time. And also, in fact, according to my stopwatch, I've run out of time completely. I don't want to hold the proceedings up. So to get on to... Um, I believe I'm scheduled to read today later. Um, for Randall Jarrell, perhaps we can defer the reading of that till um, this afternoon. Sorry? Five minutes. Oh, five more minutes, really? Okay. Okay, great. Um, I will say a little bit more about Randall Jarrell this afternoon. Perhaps we can read just one, one poem of his um, while, we're, while we're here. Uh, Jarrell wrote this book in the early 60s at the height of his powers. You know when you say poets are working the height of their powers. Um, but actually he was literally working the height of his powers. And he's one of those interesting poets who, rather than kind of very gradually working up to the height of their powers, um, very suddenly became this extraordinary poem, poet who really had this in, a really rare um, empathy with others and this, this sense of the other and what they're experiencing. And he's also very well known as a poet, a male poet who could write from a woman's perspective. I mean, women critics have said this. Um, but he, he had no children of his own, but he was, he was really very much interested in how one gave literature to children to help them, as it were, navigate the world as I've just been describing. And so this book, um, The Bat Poet, um, is a, a short story. It's a very simple short story. Basically, it's about a bat who gets separated, more or less uh, uh, deliberately, from the rest of his flock. What's that? <laughs> a murmur of bats. The rest of his murmur. <laughs> um, and as the more separate, it's, it's like a kind of transcendentalist kind of um, story. Um, the more separate it becomes, the more he starts perceiving other things that the rest of the flock um, can't see. And he, he wants to explain to them, you know, oh, look, when you stay up awake in the daytime, you can see these things. And they said, that sounds horrible. I don't want to do that. And so he has all these experiences, and he's trying to find a way of communicating them. And through the poem, uh, through the story, he says several poems about the things that he sees in the daytime. Um, and... That he, reads, he says these poems to friends, the chipmunk, for example. He writes a poem about, he composes a poem about the mockingbird and goes to tell the mockingbird about it and the mockingbird thinks, eh, so what? Um, and then he goes back to the, the other bats and says, look, you know, and he tells them this story. But like many poets, he's, he's, he's obliged to feel somewhat isolated in his own um, little world and um, begins to realize that the craft itself is what matters the ability to describe what you've seen, to bear witness to what you've seen, is enough in itself. And he does communicate, but not with the, uh, perhaps with the original intended communicates um, that, that he intended. He communicates with a chipmunk. And so he, he breaks through species barriers and communicates with those they didn't originally see as his kin. My favorite poem um, of, of Jarrell's um, animal poetry, as it were, as this one, The Mockingbird. And perhaps I could just read this before, we keep this in our heads for later on, before we um, move on to the next thing. Um, the Mockingbird. Look one way, and the sun is going down. Look the other, and the moon is rising. 
The sparrow's shadows, no, sorry, the sparrow's shadow is longer than the lawn. The bats squeak. Night is here, the birds cheep. Day is gone. On the willow's highest branch, monopolizing day and night, cheeping, squeaking, soaring, the mockingbird is imitating life. All day the mockingbird has owned the yard. As light first woke the world, the sparrows trooped onto the seedy lawn. The mockingbird chased them off, shrieking. Hour by hour, fighting hard to make the world his own, he swooped on thrushes, thrashers, jays, and chickadees. At noon, he drove away a big black cat. Now in the moonlight, he sits here and sings. A thrush is singing, then a thrasher, then a jay, then all at once, a cat begins meowing. A mockingbird can sound like anything he imitates, the world he drove away. So well, for a minute, in the moonlight, which one's the mockingbird, which one's the world? Some people see that as a self-portrait of Jarrell's. For the first part of his career, he, ch he chased away all kinds of um, specters in the world of poetry. And I'll mention some maybe later on. Um, people, people who were uh, false um, heroes, as it were, in the poetic world, or self-proclaimed. And he also said very, very lacerating things about everyone from T.S. Eliot to Wallace Stevens. And he chased them all off. And of course, the, his, the, the accusation leveled at him by critics was that in turn, he sounded like several of these people. So uh, the mock he's the mockingbird, maybe. He frightens off everybody else and then starts imitating them anyway. But I think at the end, however, the wonderful thing about him, if we look at poems like The Woman at the Washington Zoo, he finally found his own voice. And these poems um, in this little story also manifest that extraordinary gift. Okay, thanks.